The Holy Nation is a veritable theocracy that uses their religious principles to violently discriminate against non-human races, and even some of the human ones too. Perhaps most of all, the Holy Nation hate the Chinese. I mean the Hivers, they really hate the Hivers. That being said, today's challenge is to try to establish a sleeper cell of bug men living within a Holy Nation city. If you're unfamiliar, a sleeper cell is defined as a group of people who inconspicuously remain dormant in a community until actually activated by a prearranged signal to perform acts of espionage, sabotage, and or terrorism. The ultimate goal, abolish the ethnostate by overthrowing the local government with a vermintide of hivers. Let's begin. The first thing any good rebellion needs is a man on the inside. For our purposes, we need someone average and with a good, strong Christian name. I chose Motumbo. He will function as a relatable everyman that will allow us to gain the trust of the Holy Nation and destroy it from within. Don't be deceived by Motumbo's long limbs and movie star physique. He is terrible at virtually everything. We will have to train him from the ground up like some kind of feral child that we pulled out of a wolf den. In particular, we need to focus on basic life skills such as sprinting, stealth, lockpicking, and kidnapping. Don't. Don't ask questions. My favorite way to do this personally is by harassing the local homeless population. But if I'm going to persecute homeless people, I want it to be official and definitely on the record. Therefore, I decided to hold a local election to determine the president of HUB. Since only Matumbo showed up, I declared it a landslide victory in our favor. Now we could start ruining society the morally correct way. Our first move was to enact an economic redistribution policy where we redistributed everyone else's stuff directly into our inventory. We then traded these items for the entire city's food supply. This served not only to enrich our caloric intake, but it also caused our citizens to wither and starve. Amazing. We then spent the next two weeks connecting with our supporters by breaking into their homes late at night to conduct wellness checks. Wake up. Yeah, it's me, Matumbo. You doing alright? I just, uh, I just came to check on you. Yeah, no, it's okay. It's okay. Go back to sleep. That's, uh, I like to watch. It's okay. If any of them got a little too uppity about it, we knocked them the fuck out. After two successful weeks of being the president of the largest migrant camp in all of Kenshi, I felt as though I had the necessary skills to become a domestic terrorist. So we set off to join the Holy Nation. Motumbo successfully migrated to Blister Hill. It's the capital of the entire Holy Nation, as well as the place where their leader, Lord Phoenix, lives. So not only are we establishing a sleeper cell in enemy territory, but we're basically doing it in their version of the White House. Now the first step is to go house shopping to establish our headquarters. Fortunately, I pawned everything in the hub that wasn't nailed to the floor, and so money was not an issue. Now, when you're new to the human trafficking business, what you really want is square footage. I concluded that this house here offers the best bang for my buck when it comes to hiding forbidden species from God's eye. Yes, it's a bit of a fixer-upper, but look who's talking. Shalom! We had bought our first home. Now that this is done, we have to perform what is known as a proof-of-concept test. You see, before we attempt to smuggle 50 hivers past border security, we should start with one, just to make sure it's even possible. So Matumbo set forth into the world to find his first recruit. We traveled to the western hive lands, where we could surely find an endless supply of potential recruits. The only issue is that Recruiting has never been particularly easy in Kenshi. At best, you can recruit local alcoholics from the tavern. However, that doesn't work for us. We need a scalable solution. To address this issue, we have the Recruit Prisoners mod, which allows us to kidnap people, gaslight them with several hours of psychological torment, and eventually convince them to join our party thanks to a neat little mechanic called Stockholm Syndrome. So all we have to do is kidnap and imprison a hiver. I skulked around the area for some time, pretending to be mentally ill. This lured the Hivers into a false sense of security and allowed me to get closer to my target. Once he was alone, I hit him over the back of the head with a rock and dragged him into the shadows. One quick run across the desert and we were now outside the gates of Blister Hill. I decided to try the simplest approach, which was to just carry his unconscious and bleeding body past the police and into my apartment. I think if it worked for Jeffrey Dahmer, it should also work for me. And just like that, we were in. Motumbo then deposited our first lucky recruit into his very own rusty steel cage. 
I decided to leave our new recruit in darkness for two to three days so he could think about all the poor decisions he's made. When we returned, he was more than eager to join the squad. Now we just had to choose a new identity for him. It needed to be inconspicuous and disarming. I settled on calling him Mr. Patel. Sure, Mr. Patel might be Indian, but he's definitely not part of a grassroots terrorist organization. It was perfect. We could now enter phase two of our operation, stockpiling supplies. You see, if Motumbo is going to kidnap dozens of hivers and hide them under the floorboards of his studio apartment, they're going to need a steady food supply. Otherwise, this whole Jeffrey Dahmer parallel might become a little too real. So I elected Mr. Patel to be the head of agricultural development. Motumbo smuggled him past the city gates again and back into the free world to establish a large-scale farming operation. I had a lot of faith in Mr. Patel. I knew he wouldn't do something dishonorable, like fleeing with all my blood money. Technically, to operate a farm successfully, you're going to want more than one person. But I didn't want to attract too much attention, so I left it all up to Mr. Patel and his army of windmills. But don't worry. Matumbo will be watching, very closely. After 22 hours of painfully micromanaging Mr. Patel, I finally felt as though we had a reasonable amount of food stockpiled. Now we could finally return to our real passion of violently coercing people to join our social justice flash mob. In many ways, you could consider what we're doing to be somewhat like a business. And the first step in expanding any business is to establish a recruitment office. I named ours Abu Ghraib. Technically speaking, it was just a desolate shack in the middle of the desert, but functionally it would operate as an indoctrination chamber, allowing us to grow our numbers indefinitely. Allow me to demonstrate. Mutumbo goes to the hive lands. He kidnaps and recruits one hiver. Then both Mutumbo and the hiver go kidnap two more hivers. Then the four of them kidnap four more hivers and eight more and 16 more. In other words, Mutumbo gets hella bitches. Mutumbo would then individually smuggle each hiver into the city and deposit them safely in his living room. This would constitute the beginnings of our sleeper cell. However, about halfway through this mission, I realized two things. I was running out of space in my apartment and I forgot to pick up the food from Mr. Patel. Let's solve the easiest problem first, our lack of space. The solution is quite simple actually, we just need to buy a second apartment. The only road bump in this mission is finances. Since freelance kidnapping is not yet recognized as a job, Motumbo has technically been unemployed for the past 38 days. As such, we don't have a lot of money. I decided to solve this by invading a sovereign state. Technically, it was just a way station, but that's a good start. I took my army of 30 hivers to the way station territory and launched a full-scale assault. You may think that an army of naked bugmen may not seem that intimidating, but unless you're some kind of freaky sex guy, then you would be wrong. After pawning all of the worldly possessions from this outpost, we finally had enough money to buy a second apartment to store our hivers. Now came the more complex problem. We have over 30 hivers and they need food. Fortunately, we have the food. The issue is, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but Motumbo has kind of developed a bit of a reputation due to his eccentric personality, and I'm worried that Mr. Patel could be in danger if he is caught supplying food to Motumbo. So I orchestrated a complex but believable series of events that would allow us to transfer the food from Mr. Patel to Motumbo without anyone ever knowing. First, I used my new property to start an illegal money printing operation. This would serve two purposes. One, it would provide us the rest of the money that we would need for our entire playthrough. And two, it will devastate the local currency through hyperinflation, inevitably resulting in the holy nation becoming a barter economy based on sexual favors. We would then use our newfound wealth to open two seemingly legitimate business ventures. The first would be a rock mining company, and the second a veterinary practice. This will make sense shortly. The rock mining company would logically buy their food from the closest available trader, which happened to be Mr. Patel. Now the rock mining company has our food. This constitutes our first layer of encryption in this illegal food smuggling operation. Unfortunately, shortly after buying the food from Mr. Patel, the pet of one of the rock miners becomes sick. He decides to take his pet to our veterinary practice to diagnose the issue. In fact, the animal is not sick, it's dead. We have hollowed out its insides and filled it with over 800 kilograms of white rice. Now the vet has our food. He will wait until nightfall, at which point he will deconstruct his entire office and sprint across the desert. He will rendezvous at an unmarked beach, 
ultimately equipping a hazmat suit before swimming 800 feet through acid water to an uncharted island and burying the food under a pile of rocks. Overnight, the vet and everyone that works at the rock mine will go to a plastic surgeon to legally alter their name and genitals, thus allowing them to vanish into the night like an elderly person with dementia. The next morning, a skeleton will find this food and take it to a nearby town to sell it. After all, skeletons don't need food. This is completely realistic. Shortly after the transaction is complete, I will hire a local schizophrenic man to enter the shop and purchase our food from the shop owner. Following this, the man will proceed to brutally murder everyone inside the store, thus leaving no witnesses to this transaction. Who is this deranged lunatic, you may ask? His name is Motumbo. And with that, we have completed the most inconspicuous food transaction in all of human history, thus ensuring the safety and anonymity of both Motumbo and Mr. Patel. I would complete this elaborate series of events once a week, every week, for the rest of the playthrough. Naturally, I had Motumbo use a different disguise each week to maintain a low profile. Now, with a steady stream of both money and food, our kidnapping operation had truly entered its renaissance. By day 29, we had managed to kidnap a total of 200 hivers. In fact, we had stolen literally everyone from both of the nearest hiver villages. At this point, we had to resort to traveling north to kidnap fogmen. Fogmen are hivers that got mixed up in some kind of pyramid scheme, I don't know, it's not really clear to me, but they serve a higher purpose now. After reaching a total of 255 hivers, I decided to stop because I had run out of names 90 hivers ago. Next began my quest to find housing for my 250 illegal immigrants. It is now time for us to aggressively expand into the real estate market by monopolizing all housing. What's that, Mr. Realtor? You want to know why I need 14 apartments? Fuck you. I decided to purchase almost all of the real estate in Blister Hill and evict the previous tenants. Local homelessness and unemployment was now approaching 100%. In fact, a small confederation of filthy hobo people began to collect in front of the city in protest of my smooth business moves. I took this as our first successful move against the holy nation and a sign of good things to come for the revolution. With 255 sleeper agents now secretly implanted within the holy nation, we could begin training for the final solution. What? Is that one already taken? Hitler! Okay, we're just going to call it the big attack. I converted some of the bars into training spaces so we could muscle up some of these losers. I had never attempted a coup d'etat before, so I wasn't exactly sure how much preparation was necessary. I settled on combat stats around 20 to 30 as my end goal for training. Additionally, I created several private hiver workshops throughout the city to manufacture weapons and armor for our soldiers. We even had a cafeteria. At this point, we basically had our own underground city operating behind a series of locked doors and secret handshakes. With our hivers now preparing for the Day of Reckoning, we could begin sabotaging the holy nation and weakening it from within. You see, many scholars cite a degradation of morals and values as the driving force behind the collapse of the Roman Empire. I wanted to apply this concept to the holy nation. Certainly, creating a populace of unemployed transients was a good start, but I think we can go even further. If you recall, I purchased every store in the entire city. That meant there was no one to sell food to the citizens. Don't worry, we can fix that. Every night I would have my hivers kidnap between two to four guards or citizens from the town and transport them to one of my many apartments, where their bodies would be mechanically separated while my secret society of hivers watched on intently. Their limbs were then processed into raw human meat, and I opened my very own deli in the corner of town where I sold this meat to the local townspeople. Everyone in town was now a surprise cannibal. Try passing judgment on me now, you sick fucks. For the cherry on top, I also had Matumbo travel to the swamps to purchase large quantities of opium and cocaine. On the nights we weren't kidnapping street urchins and processing them into chicken nuggets, we would sneak up on people, knock them out, and plant cocaine and opium in their inventory, thereby getting them addicted to an expensive and highly illegal drug. For example, I found this priest here who was asleep and I put 8 kilograms of opium in his inventory. That's enough opium to kill 100,000 people. I don't, um, I don't think this guy's gonna wake up. Now, we definitely had the moral high ground on them at this point. After all, these people were literally homeless, unemployed, racist, cannibalistic drug addicts. So, yeah. 
I finally felt as though the Holy Nation was at its most vulnerable, and we were ready to activate our sleeper agents for a full-scale assault on Blister Hill. I began the assault by launching a distraction. You see, one of my apartments in the far corner of town has been filled with albino gorillas that I imported from the nearby regions. Motombo released them into the streets, thus drawing the guards' attention away from our next step. If you remember, sleeper cells are typically activated by a prearranged signal or code phrase. So I had Motombo climb to the highest peak in the city and scream this activation phrase at the top of his lungs. This thing, this thing, this thing is, is, is 300, 300, 300 bucks. bucks. Thereby alerting my 255 hivers that now was the time to strike. This was the horror that awaited each and every one of these xenophobic freaks in the Holy Nation. Of course, some tried to escape, but little did they know, I had already created a 300 mile long wall around the entire city, ensuring that none would escape alive. Combat broke out in the streets, and countless were dead within the first hour of the assault. This was a great start, but the real metric for success was sitting in this house right here. Lord Phoenix, the leader of the entire holy nation. If we could take him down, surely the morale of the remaining guards would shatter. I sent three of my best bugs to fight him, and they're dead. I sent 100 of my best bugs to fight him, and I'm not going to lie, it was actually pretty competitive. Phoenix is very tough, but eventually we managed to slowly whittle him down to a point of unconsciousness, at which point we stripped him naked, put him in a cage, and beat all of his friends into submission. And with that, victory was ours. Some fighting persisted throughout the day, but it was clear our sleeper cell had successfully overthrown a corrupt and politically incorrect government. Without a doubt, justice was served on this day. The only thing left to do was to rebuild. We had at our hands a rare opportunity to learn from the mistakes of our forebearers and build a better and more accepting society. The only rule? No humans allowed. Sorry, Mutombo. I hope you enjoyed this challenge, because I plan to do more like it in the future. Thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.